evening and welcome to our latest Love Our Union event. My name is Megan Gallagher and I am the Scottish Coordinator at Conservative Progress. Before we start, I would like to run through the setting of tonight's event. Although I have a number of questions to ask our guests this evening, should any audience member wish to contribute, either by asking a question or adding a comment, please use the chat box and I will try to get through as many of them as possible. The event should last roughly 45 to 50 minutes and I'm hoping to cover a range of topics regarding Scotland's place in our United Kingdom and what we all need to do to preserve it. I am delighted to be joined by the leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Douglas Ross MP, and although Douglas Ross needs no introduction, he is getting one anyways. After being a Murray councillor for 10 years, Douglas was elected to the Scottish Parliament in 2016 as a list for the Highland MSP. He then stood in the 2017 snap general election where he was elected as the MP for Murray, defeating the SNP and taking out one of their highest profile MPs, Angus Robertson. He became leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party this year. Douglas has a track record in winning against the Nationalists and combined with his ability and determination has put our party back in the race for the 2021 Scottish Parliamentary election. Hello Douglas, thank you for agreeing to be our panellist this evening. No, thank you very much Megan and, and apologies for these technical glitches that seem to beset my uh, attempts to connect with people whether it's members, whether it's um, uh, virtual roundtables I'm having and such like uh, we got there in the end. We definitely did and thanks again and we're just glad that we've got you now. Douglas, I know you've had a busy few months since becoming leader in, of the party in Scotland and I would like to ask how are you enjoying your new role as party leader and did you think some years ago when you were a councillor that you'd be entering the 2021 Scottish parliamentary elections as leader of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party? Well, as, as a typical politician, can I deflect to not answer that immediately, <laughs> Megan? And, and just maybe if it's okay with you, uh, make a few opening remarks, because I, I really am uh, delighted to have the opportunity to speak uh, to Conservative Progress members uh, this evening, albeit a wee bit later than, than we scheduled. And again, apologies for that. Um, and I'm especially pleased about uh, the work that Conservative Progress uh, are doing with the, the Love Our Union campaign. And I think it's clear from what I said in, in my conference speech um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and we'll come on to that in a minute, that the need to, to promote in our party the good that the, the union does and how each of the four nations of the UK really contributes to it, it is a view clearly that, that I strongly share. And um, the reason I, I maybe took a, a slightly novel approach in my conference speech to uh, be a, a little bit controversial and, and to say things that people aren't used to hearing uh, potentially at conference speeches, it was because I think there is a, a small minority in our party, a, a section in our party, that's that's all too willing to give up on the union. Now that's either because they think the, the fight is already lost and they believe uh, independence is inevitable, and, and I want to say that's absolutely not the case, uh, or because some believe that, that England um, and the, the UK government's uh, contribution uh, to England is somehow uh, more important than that to the other parts of the UK, Scotland, Wales uh, and Northern Ireland. Um, and sadly, these views exist at, at all levels in our party. So it's important now more than ever uh, that those of us who believe in the, the future of our union, that it's worth fighting for, it uh, challenge those views. Um, and that's certainly what I was doing at conference. Because if we don't challenge those views, the only people that are going to gain out of this are the nationalists. The SNP, it will benefit from it. It gives substance to their argument that the rest of the country doesn't care about Scotland. So why should Scotland it want to remain part of the United Kingdom? Now, we know that's not true. And we just need to restate our commitment across the whole of the party at all levels um, that um, we are Conservatives and we are Unionists. It's in our name, it's in our DNA, and it's absolutely what we are about. Um, and I really thank Conservative Progress um, for the work uh, that you're all doing to make that case. Because ahead of next year's elections, and as you said, I, I fought the SNP and I, I've beaten the SNP before, um, we do face as a party really the most important election in, in the history of evolution. And the whole of the Conservative Party right across the country needs to get behind us uh, for that fight because an SNP majority is not inevitable, uh, independence is not inevitable, and it's not going to be easy. I'm not going to underestimate the challenge that, that faces us, um, but we've got to remember, in 2016, when I was elected as a Highlands and Islands list MSP, people had written the Tories off. 
they said, you know, the SNP have got a majority and the opinion polls are going to repeat that. They're going to be returned uh, with another majority and the Tories are, are going to languish well behind. Well, we stopped the SNP. Uh, we removed their majority. It was done because the uh, Scottish Conservative MSPs went from 15 to 31. We more than doubled our representation in Holyrood. So let's not, you know, uh, fall into this trap of defeatism and disinterest. Let's go in there positively about the positive case we can make for the union and the positive case we can make for Scotland. And that's certainly what I've been trying to do uh, in the first couple of months uh, as leader. We've also got to uh, I'll try and bring this. I see quick marks, Megan, and as you know, I'll just go off and, and, and speak far too long. So curtail me when I need to be curtailed. But we've also got to, you know, remember we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic, a pandemic that continues to, to take lives. That we're seeing, uh, a, you know, and sadly, a, an increase in infection rates across the country, businesses uh, closing, uh, jobs under threat. And nobody wants to be focusing on a constitutional battle that we fought six years ago. They want all the attention of governments, of political parties, of politicians to be focused on getting over uh, this COVID-19 challenge that we all face, this crisis that has enveloped both the health emergency and the economic emergency that we'll have to, to respond to. So that's why I think the Constitution has to be part. We can continue to make a positive case for the Union, uh, a positive uh, message for for Scotland's place in the union and people that the property is facing up. After all, neither the party for, for a couple of months, you know, when I was still a councillor, did I, did I see myself going into this election as a leader? So that was not the case. But interesting, when I was elected, I was elected in 2007, and another thing happened in 2007, I was elected first. By time, in a elected the same period that the SNP have been in charge in Scotland. I see our standards reducing in that time, the health service uh, not getting the prioritisation and, and the support it needs. We see hospitals being opened that patients can't go to see a doctor touch justice system. We've seen local government not getting the uh, support you'll know in, in your own local authority area, Megan. You know, the, the reduction in council budget when central government are telling councils to do more but with less. There's an awful lot uh, in the time I've been an elected politician that the SNP uh, have let Scotland down on uh, because they've been fixated with their ultimate aim, their raison d'etre, their obsession, which is best taking from the rest of the UK. So I certainly never uh, envisaged when the good people of Falkerberg's land bride first returned me as their councillor uh, now 13 years ago that I would be in this position leading the Scottish Conservatives into this election. Um, but I do so knowing uh, that the, the damage in many areas that uh, an SNP Scottish government who don't want to work with the UK government, who don't want to see our two governments working together, who simply want to promote their aims for independence and the damage that does to Scotland, and I want to see that change. I'm so proud of my country and I'm ambitious for our country's future, uh, but we can't do that if we're constantly fighting battles with Westminster and we're constantly focusing on a constitutional argument rather than the issues that people right up and down the country want their politicians to focus on. I Absolutely. promise not every answer will be that long. <laughs> no, that was fantastic, Douglas, and thank you for your opening remarks, and, and particularly in relation to, um, you know, the, the amount of failings of the SNP-led Scottish Government that we've witnessed over the years. You know, you and I could sit and have a, a chat about council budgets, you know, for hours and end, um, about how much they've been decimated and how that's affecting, you know, our communities throughout Scotland. Um, and I think that's definitely one of the arguments, you know, that we've been, you know, at least trying to get. Um, through to people that it is the SNP-led um, Scottish Government that's got control of these budgets and they are harming our communities. Um, going back to what you said during your opening remarks, as it was um, and very interesting when you said um, that you use your speech to have a, an open and honest um, discussion with party members and it was something I really admired because it's not, I would say, your usual party conference speech um, because you, you did use it to in a sense, you know, not criticised, but certainly, you know, say we're not doing enough. And it was a wake up call, in a sense, to the UK government. And do you think that your speech has had an impact? And do you think now that we will see a change in terms of how the, the UK government, in, ter in terms of our own party members, um, look to Scotland and see them, you know, moving forward to how we actually protect and preserve Scotland's place in our union? 
Yeah, well, well first of all, I've, I've never shied away from unpopular arguments, whether it's, um, you know, as, as an elected politician standing up for, for local people in my constituency or, or for cases that I think are, are really important across Scotland, uh, or in my other pastime, you know, I'll make unpopular decisions on the football pitch, but you've got to have the confidence to do that and, and to believe uh, in your own argument, in your own case, uh, and to make it even if you think, you know, I could have walked into to the virtual conference hall and made um, a very nice speech that people would have said, you know, that, that's fine, but it wouldn't have hit home the message I wanted to hit home. And therefore, to, to respond to your point, yes, I, I think it, it has made a difference. It is a wake-up call. Certainly the response I've had from colleagues south of the border when I've been down in Westminster and in, in people that have been contacting me since, um, it has had the desired effect. Um, it's not met unanimous approval, and I wouldn't expect it to. Um, but I think everyone can agree that this is not just about the current Conservative government or indeed Conservative governments. This is successive governments. Since the referendum in 1997 and, and devolution in, in 1999, um, there has been a, a slow um, reduction in the interest in, in politics and policy in Scotland from a UK government level. And it's led to this kind of England only mentality. Um, and the UK government thinks, well, we send up money to Scotland to deliver education or health, etc. But that doesn't mean we have to forget about education and health uh, in Scotland. And I think there has been that devolve and forget attitude. Um, and it clearly has had an impact on the union by reducing the visibility of the UK government uh, and its actions uh, in Scotland, to the point that even in some areas of uh, reserve competency, like digital connectivity, which is are administered by the Scottish government, if you ask the, the average person, they can't see the effect that the UK government has on their everyday lives and things like that. Uh, and then it's more likely that they will value the, the union less. So we've got to see that, you know, the um, the ebbing away of interest does have uh, an impact on what people themselves value. So it was, uh, my speech was, was an attempt to draw a line under that, uh, to see that the UK government needs to do far more to showcase what it does and its role in Scotland, but also say that, that the UK government needs to um, stand up to its role uh, as a government for the whole of the UK. The Prime Minister has a very ambitious levelling up agenda. We've got to show an interest in all parts of the country and all areas of policy uh, across the UK, that includes Scotland, uh, whether they're devolved or not. No, absolutely. And what I have noticed as well with the, the party since you becoming leader, Douglas, is that we are getting better with our graphics in terms of sharing and showing um, you know, the, the Scottish public that this is what happens when you've got a, a UK government addressing the pandemic. This is the money that comes to support our businesses, jobs, livelihoods through this very difficult and challenging time. But I mean, it's definitely something that I hope will continue um, once we, we manage to get out of this pandemic to actually show the worth of the union um, and how important it is to the people of Scotland. Um, another interesting point that you mentioned there in your response in relation to the SNP continuously blaming Westminster and the Conservative Party for everything that goes wrong, even if the blame firmly lands at the SNP's doorstep. What would you say to voting voters, and this is now moving into to speaking about the union, um, what would you say to voting voters who might consider voting to leave the UK should another referendum take place? Would you automatically go to the, the argument of, well, it's the SNP that are failing the people of Scotland, or would you try and talk up, as you said there in your, your previous remarks, that it's the UK government, we need to be stronger in terms of messaging when we, we do something good in the UK government? It's definitely a bit of both. Um, I think, you know, if you ask the average person in the street, are, are they happy with their education system that their, their kids or their grandkids or young people that they know that those children are getting in Scotland now, they'd probably say no, because there's uh, reduced subject choice, there's less teachers, uh, our school buildings are in a poor condition. Uh, yet you have to almost remind them that well, that has been under the remit of the SNP, the Scottish Government, uh, for the last 13 years. So any failures in these areas uh, of devolved responsibility are failures uh, of the SNP. So why should, um, you know, why shouldn't we highlight areas where they have to do better? And that's why in my first month as leader, I issued a, a jobs and economy paper. I've also followed up with an education plan to restore our schools uh, and, and their reputation uh, for educational excellence and also to, to invest in our schools because far too many uh, pupils can continue to schools and teach schools uh, that are rated uh, for condition as, as uh, poor uh, or bad. So we need to, to focus on that agenda, but also to focus on what the UK government delivers for Scotland. 
And yes, there is an element of that is saying throughout this pandemic, £7.2 billion um, in direct funding going to the Scottish Government as additional Barnet consequentials. Also, the furlough scheme and the self-employed income support that's saved almost uh, a million jobs uh, in the last seven months. So, yeah, we've got to talk that up. But we can't just throw around figures. I, I don't think we win by telling people in Scotland, well, you have to support the union because it's given X number of billion to get Scotland through this pandemic. We've got to be able to show that that's because the Union of the United Kingdom looks after all four parts of the UK. In good times and bad, we come together. It, we are stronger because we unite together. We unite our resources uh, and spread them around to support people uh, in any part of the country. But the final point, we have to do far better at calling out the SNP and the Scottish Government when they do pick fights. People don't want their political parties to be partisan during a, a global pandemic. They, they want and expect their parties and governments to work together. But more often than not, in the daily briefing, which the First Minister says is absolutely not political, and she'll say something like, I'm not going to get party political, but, and as soon as she mentions the word but, it means she is about to get party political, she uh, has too often got away with um, uh, claims attacking the UK government, and we have been too slow to respond to that. And by the time we get a, a response from a UK government department, for it's health, uh, education, um, department for housing and local government, the support has moved on, and people have only had the type of UK government bad, Scottish government good, rather than having that balance. As a leader of the Scottish government, this is your response. But let's always respect it because there are opportunities for two governments to work there, and there are certainly opportunities for us to call out more areas where uh, the SNP are wrong in the interest of them or the UK government. Thank you very much, Douglas. And I, I like obviously that you've turned to education because this is the same SNP led Scottish Government who prioritised the referendum bill over the, the education bill, which now seems to be non existent. So, I mean, I think it very much is a, a single issue government that we've got in place, sadly, in Scotland. And keeping on the union track, I was trying to get away from um, football an uh, analogy tonight, but it looks as though we have got a question and saying hi, Douglas, um, Ed McGuinness, and thanks for the call. I know football is a passion of yours. What is the best football and analogy you can apply to the current situation with the union? Gosh, I don't know. I, I, I tried to do it uh, visually the other uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was one of the match officials at England v Wales. And I thought it was a very good union message that you had England v Wales playing and, and Scottish match officials refereeing. So I thought uh, the image of that was, was quite good. What I always say, uh, the analogy between... Um, Scottish politics and, and being involved in football as I am in refereeing, you've, you've got to have a tough skin, you've got to be able to make uh, sometimes unpopular decisions uh, that, that you trust um, and you there are analogies there. In terms of, of the union though, uh, football's a, a team game, it's a team sport where you've all got to work together to get a victory and I think particularly during this global pandemic we've all got to continue to work together. Uh, there are uh, the UK government does about two thirds of the testing in, at the moment in Scotland. Now, uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Jeevan Freeman like to again criticise that whenever there's a problem with the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow, they never visited the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow because it's UK government uh, funded and run. But that's doing a huge amount of testing uh, for Scotland because the UK as a whole can work together as a team to deliver for all parts of the countries. Analogy I would make is, you know, it's a team game, football team game, the union is a team game. Uh, and if we all work together, we can get the victory that we, we won in this global pandemic and going forward. Fantastic. And I think that leads nicely um, on to um, another question that we have then um, saying, you know, it is a team game and it's not just about, you know, Scottish Conservatives fighting for the, the union. It very much involves every Conservative, whether you're Northern Ireland, um, Wales or England as well. And from Holly, um, what read this evening, how can those outside of Scotland share messages on the importance of the union and Scotland staying part of it? How can this message be more effectively shared centrally and particularly in Westminster? Yeah, so, so definitely people right across the party uh, have to get behind us with this. And it's reiterating that point that I made in my conference speech that this is not a fight that's been lost. It will only be lost if the continued defeatism um, is allowed to uh, develop even further. So we have to unite as a party of unionists to say this is a fight we're all up for. It's not just for Scottish Conservatives to fight for this, it's Conservatives right across the country. Um, and we do that by 
um, following the lead that, that we're hopefully providing uh, in Scotland to be more positive, to strengthen the case for the union and see both within government and through um, party members right up and down the country, people that are, are promoting the benefits of the union, people that are proud to speak up for the benefits of the union, not simply fall into the SNP's trap, to, uh, which is, uh, from their point of view, to, to criticise everything about the union, to say it's all bad and it would be great, some this utopia that they would deliver if Scotland were to ever separate from the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's also uh, about, as I say, ensuring uh, our government departments and uh, our Conservative uh, cabinet ministers and ministers and uh, MPs uh, also realise that, that what they do has a big impact. So it's again ensuring that the benefits, whether it's city and region growth deals, whether it's the shared prosperity fund, whether it's a uh, direct investment by the UK government into Scotland, these are all areas where we can uh, strengthen the message that uh, Scotland benefits from being part of the union and also the union of the UK benefits from Scotland being part of it. Thank you very much. Um, and, and you're right, as you say, um, you know, it's very much, you know, in terms of working together, making sure that we do have a clear, succinct message going throughout the pool of the Conservative Party. And we're not just on our own here in Scotland, but this is another reason why Conservative Progress decided to get together to do the Love Our Union event was to support um, the, the Scottish Conservatives, our Northern Ireland friends, and also our, our Welsh friends as well, to make sure that we do remain part together because it is so important. Um, just talking on independence again, but looking towards perhaps the, the feelings um, of independent supporters and campaigners because um, I've had more than six years to answer the economic questions that they were unable to resolve during a 2014 referendum in relation to currency, the medium to long term economic plans, pensions and we all know the, the famous oil argument that fell flat. Um, why do you think this is and do you think that the questions could ever be answered or do you think it, they're perhaps remaining silent on these issues because they don't have the answer for them? Well, well, that's absolutely the case, and it would certainly never be my job to provide these answers to the nationalists, because if they can't provide them, then certainly someone who's uh, a strong unionist uh, will not do anything to uh, encourage that. And you're right, for example, on oil. They predicted $113 a barrel uh, for the price of oil that would take Scotland uh, to the sunny uplands, and look where the price of oil is now. They have not been able to present a coherent argument on the currency that we would have. They have not been able to answer a number of the economic questions that remain. And I did question time last week, and one of the two SNP um, panellists uh, that night said, you know, independence, uh, support for independence is now at 58%, and that's before the campaign has even started. And I thought, well, when the campaign starts, if we were ever to get back to that stage again, you would have to answer questions that you still simply cannot answer. And on the economy, which is an area that the polling also suggests people are, are looking at, and if they uh, were still weighing up whether to vote to separate or to stay part of the United Kingdom, the strength of the economy of the UK is one issue they would clearly look at. But on the economy and the economic plans of the SNP, they have no answers. So um, I, I thought it was quite an interesting thing for that panellist to say, as if you know the numbers would continue to rise when they started campaigning uh, for independence, although, of course, they never really stopped. But if they had to uh, day in, day out, back up their argument for what it would mean financially for families, for individuals, for businesses, uh, then they would really struggle. Uh, and you just have to look at Andrew Wilson, who uh, the First Minister uh, obviously uh, uses quite a lot as a, a, an advisor and, and one of the more realistic thinkers in the national camp. You know, he's recognised that there is not a rosy economic uh, position right now and has admitted that independence would lead to uh, further uh, austerity in Scotland at a time you know, when you know, we really need to, to value and protect our public services. Just for them to get separation, that would mean huge austerity and huge cuts to public services. And I don't think uh, the public right now uh, have an appetite for that. And again, that's the argument that I don't want us to be focused on, because I think we should park that issue. But if we did have to get back into this debate again, they have no answers on the economic um, future of Scotland if they were to separate from the rest of the UK. Thank you very much, Douglas. And do you think that the UK government could be stronger on that message as well? You know, just again reiterating to people how important it is that we remain part, uh, remain together for the economic argument. It's not just about you know the the bonds that we've got in terms of our history and our cultures. It's it's actually the fact that we are you know better together in terms of economic security. 
Yeah, and it goes back to something I said earlier. It is that um, political links, it's that cultural links, but it's also the, the economic links that uh, that we all share from. And you've just got to look at, at Rishi Sunak's schemes. The, the Trello scheme was as successful uh, in the north of Scotland as it was in the south of England. Uh, the hospitality and tourism industry in Wales and Northern Ireland, England and Scotland benefited from the, the cut uh, in VAT from 20% to 5%, the extension of that to Barch uh, next year. These are all issues that you know, were the same right across the country. It was an urgent need that this UK government has stepped up to deliver on, and it is one that has uh, helped businesses, uh, protected jobs, and secured um, um, vital um, jobs in, in the forthcoming period, the, the more difficult months ahead, because of the um, strong action taken by the UK government, backed up by the UK Treasurer and UK funds to support every part of the union. Thank you very much, Douglas. I'm just looking back at the, the question and answer box just now, and I've got a question in from Rose McCall, um, one of our, our uh, councillors from Perth, and she's saying that considering the strong stance that the PM has made and continues to make on a second independence referendum, um, a stance that she is happy with, is there a possibility by removing the independence question in this way? Does that mean that the question moves towards Brexit in the, the EU, where the decisions and bills coming through Westminster have a greater effect, and how do we counter that for the Holyrood election? Yeah. Well, that, just uh, an anecdote to, to show Ros that I remember uh, the last time I met her was in a petrol station between Perth and Glasgow and I thought in, in my mask at the coffee machine no one would recognise me and Ros came up to me and we, we had a good chat about my education policy uh, and paper that I'd launched just the day before so good to hear from uh, Ros again. Uh, I don't think sadly uh, we will be able to move on from the constitutional argument in this election because as you mentioned earlier the SNP and the Scottish Government, in their programme for government just uh, a few months ago, they prioritised independence over uh, a new education bill, which they previously promised. When the Scottish Conservatives had an opposition day debate in Parliament, again, the SNP um, prioritised separation over schools. We wanted to focus on other issues rather than the Constitution, and they put it straight back there. On Brexit, clearly, um, you know, it's it's an issue that's different in my Murray constituency, where almost 50% of people voted to leave to the whole of Scotland, where 62% of people voted to remain. But we've seen just this afternoon and, and into this evening that uh, talks that um, had broken down and had completely stopped have now started again. So there are uh, still opportunities and there's still a great desire uh, by uh, the Prime Minister and the government to get a deal with the EU. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of the year, when we come out of this transition period, we will have a deal that shows that we can continue a, a close relationship uh, with um, uh, the rest of the European Union but as an independent country. Uh, and I think there are opportunities from that uh, if we can get that deal over the line. And certainly um, I've been encouraged by what I've seen uh, just reported uh, today. And I had a, a call with number 10 uh, and some of the people involved in the negotiations just before that. Um, and it's uh, encouraging news to see uh, those lines of communication opening up again. I think Michelle Barney is going to be back in London uh, later on this week to intensify the talks uh, and hopefully get this over the line. I think that's fantastic news and a lot of people listening tonight will be reassured by your comments there as well in relation to Brexit because I'm sure we're just like you know the, the independence referendum you know we just want the argument to, to to stop now we want to move on and focus as you've said previously on things like education health you know making sure that our accounts are funded properly um you know making sure we've got enough bobbies on the beat they're the kind of things that we should be looking forward to um to tackling in scotland not this constitutional division of the past however just staying on um the, the constitution just for another brief moment before we move on um i've got another question from andrew waddle and he's saying is it time for a referendum to so is it time to pass a constitutional law that further protects the united kingdom from nationalism on referendums it, well obviously it, it's ultimately a, a section 13 order would be uh, only granted by a uk government so there is that protection there that a uk government would have to uh, respond to uh, doubtless a uh, constant um, request by the SNP to, to hold a referendum, but I'm not sure we need further uh, legislation to uh, enshrine that because currently uh, an official legally binding, uh, dare I say it, once in a generation or as the First Minister previously described it, a gold standard referendum, it can only be delivered through a Section 30 order which is granted by the UK Government. 
Thank you very much, Douglas. Um, just reflecting back on, in 2014, if we can just rewind back to 2014 for a second, people who supported the union, they were all called um, the silent majority. Um, and do you think it's time for people who support the union to talk louder and more positively about the benefits of being part of the most successful union in the world? And what would your message be to, to anyone watching tonight who's sort of sitting on the fence um, about Scotland's future? What would your message be to them? Well, well I definitely think we, we need uh, everyone who supports the union to be more vocal. And if we've learned anything from those who support separation is they've never given up. They've never uh, reduced their volume or their enthusiasm uh, for independence. And, and perhaps we took our eye off the ball because we thought 55% vote in 2014. We had won uh, a referendum that both sides uh, agreed to accept. And, and sadly, one side has continued to promote uh, their case to, to rip Scotland out of the UK for the last six years, as I said earlier, at the detriment of other issues that they could be focusing on and could be delivering on. So yeah, I think we've got to be more vocal. Um, those sitting on the fence, I know it can sometimes be uncomfortable. I mean, I just have to look at my social media um, when I post anything and can see why people would be put off commenting, um, whether on social media, whether it's through the local press, uh, even just in a workplace or other cases in families. But those of us who are passionate about the union uh, know we've got to be um, as passionate and determined as those on the other side of the argument. So absolutely, uh, I think we can do more, we should do more. And I also think um, businesses um, may hopefully uh, find their voice a bit more. Because I speak to a lot of businesses who say, you know, we're really worried about the threat of independence, but, you know, I don't want to say anything because what that could mean for my company. And I think it's such a, a sad indictment uh, of Scotland in 2020. The businesses who support uh, staying part of the United Kingdom, the benefits for, for their business, for their employees, uh, and for everyone connected with their company, should in some way feel that their uh, opinion has to be hidden for fear of any um, kickback from nationalist supporters. And I think either and surely we can agree that in a civilised debate, there are people uh, on one side and on the other, and it shouldn't matter for uh, your businesses, um, for the good of your business, that you remain silent on what is uh, a big issue. Thank you very much, Douglas. And we've seen it all too often, so many businesses, as you say, having to to stay hidden in terms of their views, just in fear that, that their business will be impacted. I mean, we've seen so many different attacks. Tonics, which uh, is just down the road from me, um, from where I live in North Lanarkshire, it's, it's just horrible, the abuse that people get just because they, they are unionist or pro-union. Um, and it really shouldn't be like that. But again, that's the divisions that's been caused by, by nationalism over the last um, decade, even more than a decade now. Um, just again, looking at the questions, um, because there's a lot of people asking um, in terms of SNP victories recently, um, and I've got one saying, um, having um, from, I can't see the name here, but they've said, having first been out by the Ellen by election, with the, the following razor thin SNP victory based on a divided unionist vote, how do you plan to avoid that? And secondly, has there been any discussion um, regarding um, bringing in any um, experts um, to try um, and turn the, the Holyrood elections around for us? Well, first of all, if you look at the Ellen by-election, uh, despite what the opinion polls would suggest at the moment, uh, our vote increased there by, I think it was 1.8%. So we went up in the polls uh, in the Ellen by-election. We had a great local candidate, John, who did fantastic work um, on the ground there uh, with his team. It was a very difficult uh, by-election, given the, the current restrictions we have. But because of the uh, proportional... Uh, representation, if there were supporters in other unionist parties uh, who would have, in the event of no Liberal Democrat or Labour candidate, supported us, that comes through the transfers. And sadly, uh, we found some of the transfers from the other parties uh, went to the SNP rather than the, to the Conservatives. So I don't think, and I certainly don't uh, agree, that somehow by just having one uh, unionist candidate that would uh, deliver a different result. What I would say is, these other parties, when it goes to a larger election, from a council by-election to constituencies across Scotland and indeed the, the regional lists that we're fighting on next year, have to see that the opinion polls as they currently are, so only the Conservatives um, can put the brakes on the SNP. We did that in 2016. We can do it again uh, next year. 
And there is a, a unionist party that people can coalesce around, and that's the Scottish Conservatives. We don't need new parties. We don't need uh, deals or anything. We can show people that if they leave the union, they want a brighter future for Scotland, a, a party that's already developing new policy policies that aren't traditionally, in, in some cases, uh, viewed as Conservative policies, but a, a range of policies that can attract a broad spectrum of support uh, from across the, the unionist parties uh, in Scotland, then the only ones that can do that are the Scottish Conservatives. Excellent. It's, it's a very strong message and one certainly um, we'll be going out once it's safe to do so, um, back out in the doorsteps to, to spread once it's once the, the pandemic's over and we actually can get back to that. Um, I'm just looking again um, at the chat questions. Um, and I've got an interesting one here. It is swaying slightly from what we've been talking about, but one thing voters can't stand with all political parties is the internal division and infighting. Um, is there any scope for looking at the current um, state of the, the SNP party in terms of their selection processes and, of course, um, what's going on just now in the Scottish Parliament? Well, that's up to them. I, I suppose I'm, I'm not, again, uh, like I wouldn't dictate the, the nationalist uh, economic policy for an independent Scotland. I, I wouldn't want to dictate to the SNP what they should do with internal battles. But I think it, it shows, I mean, some of the divisions in the party, both at Westminster, I see it with uh, people who are clearly in the Salmon camp and those who are in the Sturgeon camp uh, and at Holyrood. Um, if it had not been for a global pandemic, some of these stories would, would make the, the front pages of the papers. Uh, so it's uh, it's um, something that is happening day in day out. They have divisions within their party. They have arguments within their party. Uh, but understandably, uh, people are more concentrated on um, this health emergency that we're all facing and the economic uh, emergency that that we're in and, and will be facing for many years to come. But the Parliament is trying to do something about this. The Parliament is trying to hold a, a cross-party um, committee uh, are holding an inquiry into the Scottish Government's failure uh, over the, the salmon allegations and the cost to the taxpayer, now well over £600,000, I think, in their failed uh, legal challenge uh, against Alex Salmon. So there is a lot going on, but there is a lot of frustration as well within that committee, not just from, from unionist uh, politicians, but from the SNP chair, that uh, chair of the committee, that evidence they were promised by the First Minister when she stood up in Parliament and said, yeah, we'll be open, we'll give you everything you need, it has been withheld. There's uh, threats to go to court to get documents. Uh, that is not the open, transparent SNP party they would like to portray. And it is something that is deeply troubling and something that we need to get to the bottom of. And I know it, whether it's Myrtle Fraser and Margaret Mitchell who serve on the committee for, for us or, or other politicians, they are determined to get to the bottom of this. But by God, the Scottish Government are making it very difficult and the SNP politicians and um, senior members, shall I say, uh, right up to the top uh, of the SNP are making it very difficult uh, to ensure this inquiry can get to the bottom and to get to the truth. Thank you very much, Douglas. So we'll leave the, the arguing and then fighting to the nationalists and we'll go on with sending out a clear and concise message to people of Scotland. That's exactly the campaign that I'm looking forward to getting stuck into when we can. Um, just moving on, because I think we've got time for one more question and then I'll leave the, the closing remarks to you, Douglas, if that would be OK with yourself. Um, with restrictions being introduced and no signs of the pandemic going away anytime soon, how confident are you of a May 2021 election being deemed viable? Well, that's what we're uh, working towards. All our efforts in terms of our policy um, discussions, development uh, and announcement. Um, are, we've already got a number of candidates in place. There's more selections uh, ongoing. Everything is geared towards uh, a May 2021 election. Uh, and until I'm told otherwise, uh, that's what I'll be focusing on. And I know that's what the, the team right across the country will be focusing on. Yes, we've got to look at any advice um, that says from a public health point of view, um, there, there may be reasons uh, not to hold it in May. Um, that will be uh, discussions. Uh, the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament has powers to uh, delay the election by a month, um, and then there would have to be uh, a vote in Parliament um, or, or, or for further changes beyond a, a month delay uh, to be taken. But right now, everything we're doing as a party, everything I'm doing as leader is gearing up to those elections next May, uh, because I think we have a very strong and positive message to deliver them. We have a alternative vision for Scotland from the SNP who want to be uh, who want Scotland to once again be sucked back into this constitutional battle 
um, rather than focusing on the areas that they could deliver on right now. Uh, and I think that's an election that we have a very strong case going into. It's one I'm really ambitious about. It's one I'm excited about. It, however, this pandemic develops over the coming months, it will be a very different campaign, uh, but we've got to adapt to that. But the whole focus of the Scottish Conservatives is on fighting that election in the run-up to May 2021 and ensuring we get the best possible result for the Scottish Conservatives. And I, I really you know, think we can, can have a good result. I think where we are at the moment and the, uh, the grounding that we are making in terms of the development with policies and candidates it is something that I think we can continue to deliver on over the next few months. And I'm really ambitious about what we can achieve. Absolutely, no, thank you very much. So Douglas, I'm going to leave the closing remarks to yourself um, because you've been an absolutely fantastic panellist this evening and we've thoroughly enjoyed um, listening to your contributions. But what would you say to each and every unionist who's on the call tonight who is now thinking about um, the, 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 the future of the union and you know how we preserve it? What would your message be to each and every single unionist who wants to get more involved and they want to help us keep Scotland as part of the United Kingdom? Uh, well, first of all, Megan, thank you very much to, to uh, Conservative Progress members for, for listening to me. Um, sometimes I <laughs> awful on a bit too, I speak too quickly, so you know, um, how I deliver my remarks sometimes. So I, so I hope I come across as, as coherent um, as you would expect and uh, a vision to take the party forward, but also to take Scotland forward. Uh, I'm really grateful to you, Megan, for, for the way you've chaired this and, and also for the invitation uh, and for everything Conservative Progress is doing for the, the Love Our Union campaign. Uh, as I said, this is probably going to be one of the most important elections in Scotland since devolution. So everyone on this call uh, and everyone who believes in the union and believes in the Conservative and Unionist Party and how we can uh, continue to forge our strong links right across this country, this proud nation of four countries in uh, the United Kingdom needs to get behind us, support us, uh, support what we're doing, get behind our call for action, put your shoulders to the wheel and we can deliver a result that many people in the media, whether it's in London or in Scotland, think can't be delivered. Well, I'll tell them they're wrong. It can be and with me at the helm, I'm determined to do that and with a great um, selection of candidates and policies, I really think we can achieve great things next May uh, and I'm delighted with anything uh, that Conservative Progress members can do to support us in those aims. And we certainly will, Douglas. Thank you so much again. And I think that's a, fine, a fantastic note to end on. So thank you very much. And to everyone who's tuned in tonight to listen, thanks again. And for those who were not able to, this will be um, uploaded onto YouTube for people to look back and reflect on. So thank you very much again, Douglas, for your time. And we'll be in touch to support you further as you enter your 2021 Scottish parliamentary elections. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye now.